Brett, my man, psyched to talk to you today. One thing uh, that I'm really excited about is you and I have always thought very similarly when it comes to training. I mean, I remember the first time we talked via email, first time I read your stuff, you replied to some of my stuff. And we're on the, the same page with a lot of stuff. So, and what I like is you have a unique ability to blend the science, like you take the science, interpret it, you have real world experience. Those two things combined are pretty rare, but then you always, you also think critically about stuff. So sometimes you'll take the science, know it, but like, ah, that doesn't really make sense of what I'm seeing in the real world. So uh, the reason you're in town actually was you just did a seminar talking about hypertrophy. So, so, so let's just get into that and break it down in simple terms for people. What actually causes muscle growth? And let's go through the different things, intensity, volume, frequency. <clears throat> so first of all, Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So, so to, to address what you were talking about a minute ago, that, I think that's so critical. So guys like you and Zach Kevinesh and Joe DeFranco, um, I always – you guys had your own gym. You were training a bunch of, you know, male athletes and females and, and, and with a wide range of clientele. And, uh, and so we kind of had a good feeling of the things that worked. We, we were all influenced by – West Side and you yep. know, Louie, Dave Tate, guys like that. And so that, when I first started training people, I remember I, I, I saved up on a, a my high school teacher salary. I actually pinched my pennies and I saved up like 15 grand to buy, you know, you know I got it all. I got this amazing uh, uh, power rack and platform with all the bells and whistles, like the monkey chin bar and uh, all the attachments, all everything elite. that you get out yeah. from Elite. You know, a reverse hyper glute ham developer, the 45 degree back extension with a sumo base, a prowler. I mean, so when you're a new trainer, don't try and reinvent the wheel. Just find people who are having success and kind of copy them. But for some weird reason, right off the bat, I start. I thought I was going to train athletes just like you guys were yeah. all doing. And I got like my first like 10 clients were all females and female friends and family members. And I'd say, uh, I, I have athletic equipment, I, stuff for training <laughs> athletes. And they'd say, oh, I love like, I love training like an athlete. And they did. They loved yeah. pushing the prowler. They loved all that. They loved the reverse hyper. So that's, you know, that's just the way the cookie crumbled for me. I now I became an expert on training women over time. So, yeah. Um, but, but Which I've I definitely, always, I want to get into that too. We'll get into that. So, so I, I have, I feel like I have a really good BS meter because of yeah. my, you know, I, I, I do fancy myself a scientist. I have my PhD. I have 44 published studies to date. But m I, equally or more important is the fact that I've been lifting for, uh, God, I'm 41. I started when I was 15. So 26 years now and personal training for, uh, you know, since I was 20. So 21 yeah. years. Wow. So, <clears throat> and not just lifting I still try to see results. I still try to gain strength. It's different when you're actually trying to, you know, the people are just set in their ways and just go three times a week and do, yeah. do the same workout. Yeah. You're not experimenting. Like I'm always conducting experiments, trying new programs and, and trying that with my clients. So, so thank you for the compliment. And I, I do like to think that I am, am somewhat unique in that regard. And that a lot of scientists, you know, there, there's a there's a guy, there's a, a researcher right now who's who's going around saying all the research shows you you top out with muscle growth at three months three months in, <laughs> and it's crazy because yeah. it's like this guy he went straight from bachelor's degree to master's degree to PhD and never trained people, uh, and so you got to have that. You, you if you train people, you know that that's just silly. Yeah. So and doing it yourself, like there's some guys that I'm good friends with and that I really respect that are more rehab guys. And know the body in and out. And, you know, sometimes I, I like their opinion on strength training hypertrophy. But I'm like, if you've never gained 20, 30 pounds, and it wasn't their goal, you know, like it's yeah. hard to relate. It's hard to really know, even if you've read all the research and know everything inside and out. No, absolutely. And, and but that's where I always say, think about that person's lens. Think about where they're coming from. Yeah. I mean, think about it, Jason. If all you did was work, say you were a physical therapist and you only saw people with shoulder injuries. Yeah you'd probably conclude that bench press and military press are bad to do. Right. Same with if you worked with people with only with people with back pain. Yep. You'd be like, why would you do heavy squats and deadlifts? So, so you always got to think about where people are coming from. And that doesn't mean ignore them. That just means, you know, uh, categorize it appropriately. Like the, 
because you can learn from people and not agree with them, but maybe it influences totally. a certain decision you make down the road. But back to hypertrophy. So there's three primary mechanisms of hypertrophy, and these are debated in by the experts. Right. So uh, <clears throat> my my buddy Brad Schoenfeld, he he likes to categorize them in three ways. There's mechanical tension, which is probably the biggest driver, and and everyone's on board with that. And you so know, just, just explain in simple terms what that means. So that just means so you can put active tension on a muscle by activating it, or passive tension on a muscle by stretching it. When you lift weights, it's a combination of both of those. But it's just you know, and and, and you know, I guess progressive overload would make sure that you're placing increased tension on the muscle over time for the most part. And I always like to say it like this. Let's say you're a male and you're 200 pounds and you get to a point where you can bench press, you know, 315 and you can squat 495 and you can deadlift, you know, 545 or something like that. Obviously, you're going to have a lot of muscle yeah. to be able to do that. Now, there are freaks where you're like, how do they lift that much weight in there? And there's reasons for that. Right. But, but for the most part, you'll be strong. You'll be pushing and putting a lot of tension on your muscles and you'll grow. But we also know those people who only trained for strength. And then at some point in time, they, they, they decided to listen to the bodybuilders and where the bodybuilders said, you know, my pecs were never that developed until I learned to bench using my pecs or until I learned to really use this muscle. And I, I use the mind muscle connection. So there are ways to grow a muscle to put more tension on a muscle, even if you're not using more weight, just by focusing on it. And what, what's cool about that is that that actually has been a, a topic of debate lately in, uh, in, in the, on the Internet with people who rightfully point out that when you use an external attentional focus, you see better results whenever it's accuracy or performance related. And when I say external attentional focus, meaning directing your attention away from the human body onto the environment. So I always say it like this, if you were going to jump, like do a, say there was like a pit of lava and you were going to jump across it and you need to clear it. You wouldn't be like, okay, Jason, activate your quads and your <laughs> right. at this exact moment yeah. to maximize jump performance. You'd be thinking, I'm going to look five feet further than that. That's where I'm going to look. And I'm just going to, or like when you squat or one at max, you're not thinking, all right, squeeze your glutes out of the hole. You're thinking like something that motivates you or like push this bar through the roof type yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, and, and if you're throwing a dart, if it's accuracy related, you're not like activate your triceps at this precise moment. <laughs> right. You're like thinking, I'm going to, you know, thinking of, I don't know what, what you think of with darts, but you, you, you always think of the environment and that's, that's true. But these guys applied that to say, everything is better when you, when you, uh, when you direct your attention externally and I'm like, no, 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 that doesn't apply to hypertrophy or fixing form or improving form. So like if you're, if you want to build glutes or lats or something like that, you got to think about it while you're doing it, improve your mind muscle connection and think about the muscle. And there's, there was always EMG research showing that, but the guys would say, well, EMG doesn't equal hypertrophy. So Brad and I did the first study on this. We just submitted it for publication and we showed that with the quads, it, it wasn't significant, but with the biceps, when you think about the muscle, it led to much greater biceps growth than just focusing on lifting the weight and uh, an external focus. So like so, Arnold said, visioning yeah. as a mountain peak. And, yeah. Not just Arnold. Yeah. Arnold said it, but everybody. Yeah. Said it. Yeah, I right, always exactly. say, you know, we should respect the bodybuilders. They kind of figure stuff out over time. Yeah. yeah. But there, there is bro science definitely, sure. but we shouldn't just disregard what they say. Yeah. And then on a tangent, I've always said this about fixing form. Why, why reinvent the wheel? Think about every cue we use with a squat, like chest up, knees out, you know, like we, we Tell me, and I always say this at seminars, like who thinks external attentional like, is better for fixing form? Okay. Give me an external cue for knee, for like fixing knee valgus. And people say, uh, uh, show me your zipper. Well, the zip, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's internal. That's not external. And that's weird. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. people wouldn't do it and they'll go, yeah. they'll go, you know, they'll say something like spread the floor. Cause that's external. And I'm like, spread the floor doesn't fix knee valgus. You can spread the floor and still cave in at the knees. You need to tell, they need to think about their knees and that fixes form better. Do I need to do a study to show that? You know, but that's a cool debate. But anyway, I'm, I'm going off on tangents. That's mechanical tension. And that's the most important driver of hypertrophy. But these two are debated with some guys 
uh, some researchers thinking they're of the utmost importance and other people thinking they don't contribute at all. Right. And I tend to believe that they contribute, but I haven't poured over the research. I, I would really need to take like a month and just read all these studies. And I, I, it's something I want to do, but I don't think it's realistic with how busy I am now. But this is metabolic stress and muscle damage. So metabolic stress is where, you know, you, you think of like the burn and the pump. So you can, you lift weights you, uh, and you do like higher reps with shorter rest periods, things like that, isolation exercise and stuff. And you can get a, a buildup of metabolites in the muscles, and you uh, and 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 this is this that's thought of to lead to hypertrophy in several ways. But um, one way through which it works is it it drives up muscle activation because it's anaerobic in, in nature, and you end up activating more of the fast twitch fibers because the type one, the slow twitch, are activated with with more aerobic um, exercises, and also. <clears throat> This is kind of funny too. All the research on heavy weight versus light load, most of them show equal hypertrophy when you lift heavier weights compared to lighter weights. Um, but and that's because as you do a set to failure, like or close to failure, muscle activation. Well, muscle activation will go up, but really you're you're just you end up recruiting all the motor units throughout the set, and that's according to Hanneman's size principle. Theoretically, you know. You should go to failure because then you ensure that you've activated all the motor units. But I, I, what's interesting about that is that the, the research on training to failure isn't that spectacular. I mean, you would if you read all the research, you would conclude that you don't have to train to failure to see good results. And then I get annoyed. And there's a lot of real world examples that show hypertrophy where people aren't even trying and they don't go to failure. Yeah. But I always get annoyed with that because I'm like, okay, but... People take that too far. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I could do a set of prone rear delt raises to failure every day of my life and not sure. even come close sure. to sure. But with deadlifts, yeah. you know, and also- But then there's, a, and, and here's where I, where I like the way you see things too, is because you could read the research about going to failure, but then you have to have the real world experience of knowing how shitty you feel when you go to failure all the time. Yes. Like our, our friend Chad Waterbury hates going to failure for, you know, the, just the kind of drain on your system that it yep. gives you and all that. So then you can't train as much, as frequently, so, as much exactly. volume. So you got to take exactly. that into account too. So that's what in my seminars, I have this slide that's like, <clears throat> everything is interrelated. So yeah. if we talk about training to failure and we say, all right, we're going to do like, think about how we all start lifting, Jason. <laughs> we do like chest day and we do our, our bench press and then our incline press and then our like f flies or and cable crossovers. And then you'd always do that last set of push ups. Yeah, yeah. You'd get so like, like 30 yeah. sets, all the <laughs> failure. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. But like, um, yeah, 30 sets to failure. <laughs> we probably shouldn't have done that. Yeah. But, uh, have pneumonia the next yeah, day. Right. Right. <laughs> Sinus infection. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but like if you did do a set of push ups to failure, it's probably not going to, it's not as crushing as deadlifts and yep. squats and these bigger lifts, but also, you know, if you just did one set of deadlifts to failure every 10 days, you could get away with it. Yeah. But if you train deadlifts twice a week and did four sets to failure, you would spin your wheels. You'd end up break, actually going backwards. So it's just context dependent. And then, so, and then another way me metabolic stress can work through kind of a separate category. There's several ways, but another one is cell swelling. And this is, this is purely theoretical, and, and I, I agree with it, uh, but the, the research isn't there. It's just purely theoretical because there's research on other tissues of the body. So, so cell swelling is the pump, and it's like the, if you pump a muscle up, you cause it to grow f kind of from the inside out. You get this swelling on the inside with, with, with uh, you know, fluid, and then the cell says, oh, crap, I, this is a threat to my architecture or my ultra structure, or whatever, I'm going to ramp up and build bigger, but that's going to take a while to confirm whether that that's even true or not. So it's just theoretical and it's hard. And, and because just to interject for a second, a guy like Hanny Rambod who trains the rock and Phil Heath strongly believes in that. So it's like, I know that's bro science or whatever, yeah. but I, I think you might share the same idea that I do that. Like, kind of just try to do everything. You know what I mean? So that's why I have a slide. Like, there's definitely says, a hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you only had time, it's like load and prog progressive over, like weight and progressive overload, no. do that and you'll, you'll get away with it. But if you could add in the other two, yeah. why not? So that I have a slide on my presentation. It says, and it's just a, a, a shotgun and it says, yeah. I take the shotgun approach because yeah. I don't know. Right. I also think 
Okay, I should explain muscle damage, then I'll explain okay. what I think about yep. the genetics of it. So muscle damage is obviously what it means. Tearing a muscle down, you get like micro lesions and, and, and inflammation, stuff like that. And this leads to muscle growth. Now, here's the thing about uh, metabolic stress and, and muscle damage. There are studies showing compellingly that you get high levels of satellite cell activation. Um, and satellite cells are like muscle stem cells that lay outside the 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 basal lamina or whatever the hell that is and, and, and it, it lends its uh it lend they end up ultimately lending their nuclei or like fusing their nuclei into the muscle and now this is called the myonuclear domain theory your muscle can only get as big as the proportionally as big as the number of of nuclei in it because the nuclei make the genetic material to give the instructions to increase protein synthesis and and there's a lot of uh, research. Uh, supporting that whole that theory, and so I think it's a no brainer to try to to do all three of these mechanisms when you work out. But like you said, triage it. So when when you first get in there, do a couple of heavy lifts with the goal of maybe hitting a PR, just getting a really heavy, strong, good quality workout, and then towards the end. Don't count reps. Like, you know, you might relate, Jason, lateral raises. Are you trying to set PRs with lateral raises oh, ever again? Yeah. That's just a feel right. exercise, you yeah. know? You might use 15s. You might use 20s. You might use 25s. You might do it with some English on it. You might do yep. it real strict. You might have your elbows more extended. And it's just a feel exercise. And the goal is to really get a good delt burn and a, a shoulder pump like that. So towards the end of the set of the, of the day, and then you want to do damaging exercise, things that – stretch the muscle to a long length and where you accentuate the eccentric component, but not too much because that interferes with training frequency. And the research is very compelling that you can get, see better results when you train a muscle twice a week compared to once. But then above that, it's, it's not, it's not as a, you know, I like to say people should train their glutes very frequently, but I think there might be a genetic component to that. And, uh, and there also might be a genetic component to like which mechanism, well, we don't even know if the three mechanisms are, are solid, but right. even if they are, there might be some people who respond better to one mechanism or yeah. another. And I say this because I've had a couple of women put two inches on their glutes in two weeks from like, I, I, they start training with me and I push their hip thrust really hard and we would do pyramids, but they do heavy, moderate, light, light to failure. But I think it's the metabolic stress. And so you can say, well, muscle does not grow that fast. So it was cell swelling. It was just, it was, uh, it, it was swelling, but their glutes never went back then. They never shrunk back. They kept growing. Right. So that was fascinating to me. So that, and then lately, this is so, so intriguing to me. There's now research coming out showing, you know, there's a strong genetic component to how much muscle damage you experience. And then think back to when you were training, you had those people who, would get so wiped out and other people who were invincible yeah. and, and, and everywhere in between. And then they just found a recovery gene. <laughs> so, uh, there's, uh, and there's another gene like this ACE, uh, uh, gene where it showed that the people who had the ACE DD allele or whatever, um, saw just as much strength gains from doing one set of lower body compared to three sets. But if, if you had the other two, the ACE one and ACE two, then you did better with three sets, but like 38% of people have the, the DD gene, which, which, and then I start thinking from experience as a trainer, I remember this client when I backed off, they saw better results. I had one client and I ended up, she was my strongest client I've ever trained, but I ended up get, whittling down, whittling down. She saw better results. Eventually her workout was four sets twice a week for lower body. Wow. I would give her one set of four exercises twice per week. And she was my strongest client I've ever had. And I have a before and after picture. I think she doubled her glute mass over time. Mm. But that's the stuff that fascinates me. So we can see, we can see research reports averages. So I can tell you on average, this happens, but when you actually conduct the research and you plot all the individual, all, like all the responses and you can see this guy here in 12 weeks actually didn't gain a single bit of muscle mass or strength. And this guy here increased his strength by 50% in his hypertrophy by 20% in this muscle and everywhere in between. And so you've got this, this these individual responses are what all it's about, what it's all about, because ultimately we train ourselves and we train our clients and that's all N equals one. So it's, a, it's yeah. good to know the research, but it's also good to know just because this applied to one person doesn't mean it right. applies to another. And then there's the real world stuff, which you know, you can't, research really doesn't show that 
like you might do, you and I might prescribe one or two sets of deadlifts, but you can do six sets of lateral raises. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the volume is dependent on the exercise. Like <clears throat> or, if it's a small exercise yeah, yeah. versus a big yeah, exercise, yeah. how much Or do you, you could do six sets of deadlifts as long as you sub should, max. As long as it says sub max and yeah. you shut it down. The problem is, especially for us, because Jason, you and I grew up reading these, these, the only rep that matters is the very last rep. <laughs> yeah, Remember yeah, that? Like yeah. every other rep is something you've already done. A waste. It doesn't, yeah. it's a waste. The only thing that matters is pushing your body to that. Yeah, new, something like right. every other rep before that is getting to that rep. Like that's yeah, the point of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And that's not true. Yeah. And so it's hard for us to t- to stop when you can do something for 20 reps to stop at eight. Yeah. When you can do something for 10 reps to stop at six yep. and leave four reps in the tank. But I've been doing more of that lately with my clients and myself. And it's, it just leads to better results because you accumulate volume without accumulating so much systemic fatigue. Yeah. So that, that was one thing I was going to ask you about because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but throughout the years, a lot of your programming – has been say one to three sets of, of big exercises working towards a top set or a PR, or maybe you might do a, a set of five to seven, then a set of eight to 10 and try to PR both of those. Um, which I love that approach. Like if you have 90 days, that's what I'm going to do with somebody. But long term, I might only do that on two or three big lifts and then like inverted rows and push ups and laterals and just pump and accumulate uh, volume. So glad you asked this question because I've, I've never been asked this before on a podcast. So I always, I love powerlifting. I've competed in a few meets. I've pulled 620 pounds. Um, <clears throat> I've benched 350, but my squat is not that good. No, I, I squat ass to grass, but it's, I've only done like four or 55 with squats. I'd love to drive that to 500, but I'm not a, never going to set any records as a powerlifter, but I love the sport. I follow it, but we've been too influenced by them. And the best powerlifters yeah. will tell you like, you know, powerlifting beats the crap out of your joints. If you do, if you do it right, if you push the envelope, if I'm trying to maximize my quad hypertrophy, why would I do get all my volume from squats? The right. exercise that beats you down the most. I, 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 so I love doing squats and deadlifts and stuff, but I also like being injury free and these tax me. And I've learned this about myself. If I push, start pushing some of these exercises too hard, it, it interferes with my sleep. Mm. I don't enjoy training as much because I'm sore. So I do my squats and again, I could do sub maximal and do more sets, but I don't like, do, I like yeah. going hard. Yeah. So I'll just do a couple sets. Like you said, sometimes just one hard set Yeah. and especially, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second, but I might do one, one or two hard sets. And by the way, when I pulled 620, I was doing one set of deadlifts a week on Friday, uh, one set of sumo deadlifts, but I would, I do light stiff legs, but I, I feel like I relied on my squat and things like hip thrust and back extensions to build my deadlift. Okay. But I needed this specificity. Like Louis theory. Yeah, yeah, but I needed the specificity in there, but not yeah. too much volume. Yeah. Um, and so I'd kind of warm up and use an indicator set as kind of how I'm feeling, and then I determine what to go for. But uh, but have you have you ever tried belt squats like yes. on a pit shark? How nice uh-huh. do those feel? I love them. Yeah, yeah. They're, yeah. they feel like love smooth as butter. Yep. And the Cybex leg press, it was like – built for the human body yeah. and like some, and there's certain leg curl machines that feel so fluid. And, uh, it's hard to find a great leg curl. that doesn't bother your knees a little, but when you find one, it's when awesome. you find yeah, it, yeah. right, right, right. And, uh, and so for me, I, I like the, the, that's, I'd rather do a couple sets of heart real at first in the first in the workout, crush your big lifts and yep. then get your volume out of the more joint friendly lifts that, that are specific to the individual. Cause what's, most friendly for me might not be what's most friendly for you, but then get, get a lot of your volume out of those for glutes. I'd rather, you know, do, do my heavy squats and deads and then do things like hip thrusts. And for, I love my frog pumps, the dumbbell frog pumps, but those only, I I always do my seminars. I make people raise their hands only around two and two out of three people like them. One in three can't stand them. They don't Mm -hmm. feel them at all. And that's probably due to hip anatomy, but some type of bridge, or pull through, or even if you learn how to do back extensions by using your glutes, these things are great. And you can build your glutes, uh, you know, with these exercises, build your quads with things like leg extensions and belt squats and leg press, build your hamstrings through different leg curls and, and lighter stiff leg deadlifts. And funny thing about stiff legs, have you ever actually like seen bodybuilders in, in the gym working out and you're like, man, they're only doing stiff legs with 185. Right. You know, they could probably use like, 
five hundred if they want. Yeah, there's but, definitely lessons to be learned. From yeah, they they're just focusing on that yeah. stretch. Let me ask you this: for someone who's maybe older, beat up, injury prone, have you ever experimented with sequencing? Let's say you do hip thrusts, then leg curls, then rear foot elevated split squats, and then squats. Yeah, so so you uh, move the bigger lift. Right, right, back. right, right. So I think that's a very wise approach. And and here's a funny thing that happened. Uh, and this is where, where I have so many instances I can tell you where it, it behooves me to be a a, re, a, a scientist slash practitioner because I'll I'll read something in the research. But you have to be you have to be at a high level to connect the dots. Most people can't. But yeah. because I read research and there's there's research on pre, on uh, pre exhaustion. And it actually does the opposite of what we intended. Like if you do flies before bench press. I mean, I'm not talking about like a pre exhaust. No, I know you're not. I know you're not. I know you're not. I know you're not. I'll get to okay. the. You, I, okay. I know what you're getting at. Gotcha. You're saying as a way to spare your body yeah, from because yeah. you you're exhausted at the end, and then you, right. you you don't have to use as much weight for squats, yep. and then you end up getting. I, I get it. But the research on pre, on pre exhaustion shows that when you do like bent like pet like flies mm-hmm. or crossovers before bench, then you end up using your triceps more. So I was doing, so I, that always intrigued me because I thought, God, we were wrong about that. <laughs> and it makes sense. Yeah. Like if totally. this is fatigued, your body would use this muscle more. Yeah. So I, do, was, I did one day I was at the gym and I did leg curls and then I did back extensions, 45 degree hypers, mm-hmm. which is body weight. And I had to stop the set because my glutes were cramping up so bad. I couldn't. And I'm like, I did it again. My glutes cramped up. And I'm like, is this the same pre-exhaustion thing going on where I pre-exhausted my hammies and now I'm using my glutes more mm. with, uh, and, and I've heard anecdotes from guys like John Meadows who says he does leg curls before he does squats and it makes him feel so much better. You hear anecdotes like that. So I know like, a lot of bodybuilders do that. Right. And then even Louis years ago, I don't know if you remember, uh, when he, when, if you had weak hamstrings, he'd have you always start your workout with glute hammers. Yeah. 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 Four <clears throat> days a week. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. four or five days a week in, yeah. in reverse hypers. Yeah. And so, yeah, so I do think there's a lot of merit in that. I think it's a wise approach. But for males and, and, and even women, we, they get it's, – it's an ego lift. We love our heavy yeah. squats and deads. It's hard to – it's hard if you can squat, you know, if, you, if you're normally doing 405 to go down to 225 and do yeah. three sets of eight at the end when you right. could normally bust up. But, Unless but, the option's never doing them anymore because they wreck you so much. But That's but I think people but I think people could do it in the manner you described, which is our egos get in the way. Well, no, but that's what I'm saying. Like if you do it first and you're doing 405 and it's wrecking you, you throw it out, and then someone tells you this approach and you're able to squat with 225, right. it's kind of better maybe than throwing it out. Exactly. You know what I mean? And like the rock trains like that. Like yeah, they'll yeah. squat 225 right. or something like after three after leg presses, leg extensions, leg curls. I bet you do. I've never seen how bad it's from from seeing his Instagram, I kind of surmised that yeah. he trains that way. But here's what's cool about what you just mentioned. So you train at the end when you're fatigued, but you retain that motor pattern. So at any point in time, if you needed to, you could demonstrate that strength. You'd re- retain a lot of yeah. it without getting beat up so much. Yeah. So, I mean, just like as in the case of the how Westside always trained, they did mostly speed deadlifts and mm-hmm. and, uh, and right. relied on uh, some of the other lifts to build the deadlifts. So you, you get the pattern in. And then you deadlift sporadically to keep it in there, but then you don't beating yourself up so much so you can train the squat more frequently. But I do think that, uh, yeah, if more people, instead of just concluding this exercise is not for me, I can't do it, you probably could do it if you had real strict form with, yeah. and, uh, and did either submaximal work. Well, I, I, I can make, uh, I can make a three fifteen pound deadlift feel heavy as hell, even yeah. though I've pulled six. So if, if you get real tight and just ease it off the floor and have a nice smooth contraction and don't let the hips shoot up, make the the, the spine perfectly neutral. Um, Actually, it's never perfectly neutral. We, we yeah. like to say that. But anyway. I, 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 well, that's a great point for, for people who are beginners or maybe not even beginners that are squatting or deadlifting so much more than they should. Like even like right. even dude, you're doing 185, but you really should be doing 135. Take yeah. another six months to get to 185 yes. properly. And, 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 and then you throw the exercise out. You're like, oh, it's fucking up my back. Well, because you're using 50 pounds too much weight. So, so think about the and hip thrusts are now in that category because they get they're got they've gotten popular. Wrong. Well, it's any exercise that people really care about setting PRs. You never yeah, see anyone yeah. muck up the seated row, right? right, you know? right yeah. like, well, you do, but yeah. you do because they just don't know any better. Not because their ego. They're like, 
psyching themselves and then using crabby form to set a PR. Yeah. Inverted rows, you know, these, these movements that like, like lying leg curls that you don't really care what you get. You're just going for the feel. Yeah. It's any exercise. And, and so yes, the big lifts are the most potentially injurious because they work the most muscle and they involve the most coordination, all this stuff. But also Equally as important is they're the people, they're the exercise that people most want to improve. Mm -hmm. And so they lie, you lie to yourself. Think about every time you've injured yourself, your body was trying to tell you something yeah. like my back isn't feeling good. I'll go for a deadlift PR anyway. And it took me like 20 years of lifting to actually finally listen to my body and, and make adjustments on the fly and auto regulate my workouts. But the exercise that people care about the most, which are squats, yeah. bench press, deadlifts, now hip thrusts, military press. That's where you let your, your, you let your form slide and you see these people and you're like, okay, you can just, I can just look at some of these women and they're like, I can, I can hip thrust 405. No, you can't. Right. You can't hip thrust the right way 405. Right. I know you can't, you know, or, or some males. And sometimes you get surprised. You, or you'll, you'll, you'll be at the gym. You'll see a guy with, with like 405 on the, on the squat, on, on the loaded on the bar and he's doing squats and you're like, Think in your head, check this out. This guy's going to do a quarter squat. And then he busts out an ass to grass squat. You're like, well, I didn't see that coming. But most of the time, yeah. you're right. Yeah. You're like, he goes down six inches and comes back yeah. up. He doesn't have the muscle mass to be able to lift that. And, and there's a misconception, too, with, with injuries and whatnot, uh, big lifts versus small lifts, which you could probably speak to this, too. You've probably seen this. People think, oh, I'm going to get injured on big lifts, not on small lifts. But I've seen plenty of times where guys do so many isolation exercises and laterals pouring the pitcher and stuff like yep. that, that that leads to a ton of inflammation and joint stress. So then they're like, oh, I can't bench anymore. I was like, maybe you shouldn't do all those sets of laterals and extensions yeah, and yeah, curls, yeah. especially curls too with the bicep tendon, you yeah. know? So the uh, good point, very good point. So like you'll get acute onset injuries when you do your squats yeah. and, and when you round your back with deadlifts and you screw yourself. And you're, It's just those well, slow tendon these issues. Are, yeah, from, yeah, these other issues, like for example – I don't do heavy tricep work ever. Yeah. They just, it hurts my elbows. It totally. beats them up. Lateral raises just beat me up over time. So I do a more slow controlled. And this, you always have to learn things the hard way. You have to screw yeah. up like six times and hurt yourself before you can finally, um, cause we, we were all invincible at one point in time oh, yeah. and you brag about, it. you know, oh, yeah. these other guys hurt themselves. I don't, I'm invincible. I don't hurt myself. And then, you know, and I can round back my deadlifts and I can have sloppy form. And then one day you hurt yourself and you kind of, you kind of think it's a fluke and then you do it again. And it takes you several times, but that's the iron game. Yeah. And you have to learn the hard way, just like I did, just like the people before us did. And it, it teaches you to respect good form. But yes, I agree with, with this single joint, especially the upper body, single joint. Well, I know lower body too. Um, use, use lighter weight, real smooth, controlled tempo and, and higher reps and uh, and and because these they, they can really the pullovers, uh, uh, curls, tricep extensions, lateral raises, a lot of those really can beat up your joints. But, Absolutely. Uh, but it's not that you shouldn't do those. Right. It's that you should. You're Just doing them. Yeah. yeah, be smart about it. And and I always say this because you see this. Uh, you, you I've never written an article blasting an exercise ever. I love biomechanics. I love studying exercises and pondering wh when and where it would be most appropriate. They're all tools. And I say, you should have a big toolbox. You'll use your, your hammer and yeah. your screwdriver a lot more than you use the specialty tool. But if you're a good carpenter, you'll, you will use this tool throughout the year. Yeah. And especially in times when you have nagging pain or some issue, you can train around things. Or you have this special client who, with this circumstance. But uh, a, a lot of the injuries and, and discomfort that takes place are – a lot of times they're form issues, yep. but a lot of times they're just program design issues. Yeah. They're, they're, they, these people don't know how to design. Everyone's volume obsessed. Mm -hmm. Everyone. I, and I'm, I'm designing programs for so many of these ladies, and they want to do six days full body every, a, a, yeah. a week. And I'm like, you know how hard that is to do it right? You, got, you can do it. You just have to do sub max. You can't go to failure and then the next day hit again, the next day on yeah on eight, eight exercises a day and doing like 20 set, 20 plus sets a, a day, you can't do it. And yep. you'll jack up your hormones and sleep and everything and have, you know, these nagging, you'll, yeah. so people have, 
I just wish more people had more because I'll do my I'll put my workouts on Instagram. And people will be like, well, I don't understand. How do you build muscle? You you only did some days. I'll do eight sets, mm -hmm. and people will say, well, what, what, you know, what's wrong? And I'm like, these eight sets beat the crap out of me. Yeah, I'm moving a lot of weight. For I don't think I was. I hate how everyone uses the genetic thing, but I don't. I don't think I was ever meant to be lift. Not not. I don't like the way I phrase that. I have. I've gotten to a point where I've gotten really strong. So if I push my sets for me, I've so if I push my sets hard, they beat me up a lot. Yep. I can't bust out 16 sets that way. Yeah. I could do 16 sets. I just have to do a different exercise and not push it quite as hard. So it just totally. depends on, and that's what we talked about earlier. Everything's interrelated. You can't go high volume, high frequency, high load, high effort, high everything. Right, Something's right, right. got to give. Yeah. So, uh, Unfortunately, we have limited time. There's so much I want to get to, so I might kind of push the pace and, and yeah. cut you off a little here. Um, let's talk about frequency. Uh, I feel like you used to do upper lower back in the day when we first connected, and now you do a uh, full body. So let's talk about that a little bit and you know what you think the importance of frequency is, how, how you've enjoyed it, and the whole progression. Okay, so yes, you're right. Um, I, I, and, and over the years, I went from, I think we all learned, we all learned body part split, and then a lot of us mix, you know, migrated. Which, just to, to spend a second on that, that <clears throat> somehow, uh, you can do higher frequency with a body part split, as you obviously know. You know what I mean? Like, Well, there's, free, there's three types of frequency. Like, if you're doing there's, a chest day, a shoulder day, and an arm day, you're... you're you're hitting shoulders exactly. three times a week. Shoulders, chest, and tries but, are getting hit three days a week. But there's frequency. There's really three different things that can mean. It can mean how how many days a week you're training. Right. It can mean how many times you hit a muscle. Yep. It can mean how many times you hit a lift. lift yeah. And so <clears throat> I am actually kind of moving back towards the idea of body part split training. I, I've mm -hmm. always... You, you know how when something's popular, it's easy to be anti. It's sure. Just count, <laughs> yeah. The counter yeah. culture, the pendulum swing. Yeah. So I've always said people see better results as a personal and think of all of us popular personal trainers from the last decade. We all, none of us train our clients with body part splits. Right. None of us. Yeah. Because you, you get this person coming three days a week. What, what if they miss a day? Like, yeah. and that's what I like about full body. It's like you're, you're just, re, you're hitting their muscles every single day. But I've, I, I love upper lower splits and I love, I love push pull. I, you know what I like about push pull is these it, it makes these ladies hit their glutes like four times a week yeah. if they do two push and two pull, um, but uh, and like if guys that you, you work in arms four days a week but but yep. total body I've gravitated towards and I love total body is probably my favorite but what I've realized now is the some the overzealous people the people who love exercise and just want to crush it I mean it's like the, what I think about CrossFit I love CrossFit but. This mentality, uh, you train on the nerve too much and you overreach yeah. and you spin your wheels because there's no fluctuation of training stress and you're, you're pushing it too hard week after week after week. And it, that's what I'm seeing with some of these people. So uh, I do, I like, I like every type of split. What I like about body, body part splits, and I haven't moved back to it with most of my clients or myself, but what I like about it is it's a natural system that pre it naturally prevents overtraining mm. because you, you, your leg day is like the other days all combined together. That's how hard it is. Your mm. leg day is like so brutal. Then, but you normally you'll have like your chest day, your back day, your shoulder day. Maybe you combine arms within one of those mm. days. Maybe you have like chest and tries, or you have a separate arm, or you do shoulders and arms. And then you have leg day, but shoulder day how nice was that day yeah you know how nice was shoulder day you do not beat yourself up from it yep. so you have natural and then you'll you'll you know most people take a they don't do seven days in a row for yeah. body parts but they'll have a day off or two days off and then they 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 do it all over so they don't over train with it and that's what i'm seeing with full bodies people just uh, their volume crazy their frequency crazy their in, uh, effort i know i never say the word intensity anymore because if i said jason i had a high intense intensity workout or are you thinking that he used a large percentage, percentage of max his one or, max, or mike menser <laughs> or, yeah. or like did he yeah. sweat a lot and yeah. his heart rate yeah. get up a lot so i just say load and effort yeah a relative load whatever but uh he, 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 something's got to give like i said so if you do high, high full body and then so upper lower works well because most people do two upper and two lower i've tried doing three upper and three lower that's hard to do right yeah I never work out seven days a week. It's always max six days, but really 
three to four, like probably four is the sweet spot for most people. Yeah. Four days a week of training. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Do, do you, because I've personally found over the years that I could do three hard days and one, like an arm day. So three and a half kind of almost. And I was talking to Ben Bruno about this recently too, because he, he said, how many days are you training right now? And I said, three or four, but honestly, I do see better strength gains just doing three hard days and then just coming in Same. like doing band pushdowns or curls or something on day. So four. I named that. So, <laughs> cause, cause, cause I've never heard anyone talk about that. I call it compound bro. And what's <laughs> funny about the Brooks. So, so like the day where you do mostly compound stuff and mm-hmm. you crush it, but you, you do three of those days, but then you miss, you're like, God, I didn't. Cause when you do the compound lifts, you you're spent at the end. You, you want to yeah. do like, you'll be like, I, I should do lateral raises. I should do some rear delts. I should do some curls, but I'm spent. Yeah. You're, my body's telling me to go home mm-hmm. to leave. So then one day a week or two days a week, you can do the lifts that, and here's my rules. You, you, on your bro day, and it's funny because a lot of times I'll be like, well, it's not really a bro day because bros don't typically hit glutes, but I can't call it a chick day. That would be <laughs> right. so, But like the bro slash chick day where you do the things that you like that aren't stressful and you just go for feel and you do mostly, and just, it's not like it's just single joint versus more. It's just what you've, what we all know over time beats you up versus doesn't. Yep. Like you can do a few sets of glute ham raises and you aren't, unless it's unless you haven't done them in a while if you've been doing these regularly you can do like with west side there was i can do reverse hypers and glute ham raises every day yeah there's certain lifts that you can do very frequently as long as you don't kill yourself as long as you're smart about and you go for feel so on those days i'll do like you know some some rear delts some some, maybe some lateral raises or cable lateral raises some maybe some hammer curls maybe some band tricep extensions Maybe calf raises, maybe abs, maybe leg curls, maybe some hip abduction worth like lateral band walks and mm-hmm. and higher up glute stuff, and and it feels good. Yeah, and you feel good, but it doesn't compromise your recovery. Yeah, it doesn't beat up your joints. Yep. And so I so agree with that. I I've I've discovered the same thing over time. So it's like you have your the you really save the days where you crush it to two to three days a week yeah. of heavy pushing it the compound lifts. And then I have a couple of good field days, whatever you want to call them, bro days or whatever, but like where you just get a nice pump and you, you, you know, it makes you feel good. If you have good mirror lighting, you go take the selfie at the end of the workout. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, man, you and I are such on the same page. I feel like we could talk about each of these concepts for an hour. But um, let me ask you this. If you have someone who wants to get big and strong, but they also are like, dude, I do jujitsu a few days a week and I always want to be fresh to play beach volleyball, go surfing, whatever. Will you reduce uh, how, you know, how close you go to failure, reduce training volume? How will you? Absolutely. So yes, for those types, you can see very good results doing two full body workouts a week. Okay. But, uh, but you know, you work with them and you say, this guy does, you know, my five favorite lifts are, are, are squats, bench, deadlifts, hip thrusts, and chin-ups. Those are my five favorite. Everyone has their own. Some people like trap bar deadlifts. Some people like single, like Bulgarian split squats. Some people like weighted push-ups, whatever your, yeah. your, your ones are. But then you make sure that the, these jibe well with that person. So yep. you, they might, they might end up getting, but you give them like five lifts that, that work well for them. And then you mostly do those five lifts and those five lifts only, but you do variations of them. So maybe one day they're squatting and one day they're back swing, one day they front squat or whatever, goblet squats or, or whatever you end up with. But they just do five exercises, like two sets, two sets of five exercises. So they're, they're doing 10 sets twice a week, 20 sets. They don't beat themselves up so much. You, you teach them to listen to their body and when they're not feeling good because jiu-jitsu is hard you yeah. know and, and muay thai all these things mma is hard now volleyball maybe they could put i don't i don't train enough i haven't worked as a, an actual strength coach to know enough about these specific sports but i have done mma training to know that i couldn't maintain my strength and do mma and i think i probably could have this was like 12 years ago when i was doing it i could have if i reduced but i tried to do the same my same stuff and it was too much yeah so you're absolutely right have them reduce, but know that the, the know the sport too. The MMA guys don't want to stop at five when they can do ten. Yeah. So instead of well, doing- so, what's your theory on that? That the concept that higher reps are more systemically fatiguing than doing lower reps. Like if you did four sets of fifteen to failure, you're more theoretically you're more drained than if you did ten sets of six for okay. the same total sixty reps. Yeah. So this is a, a, a something I'm so glad you asked me too. So. Um, 
So when you do these training studies, when you, uh, that's what I like about being a researcher. When you do, conduct these training studies, so Brad and I have found that when we'll, we'll do a heavy load versus a medium load group, mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, eight sets of three versus three sets of eight or something like that or, yep. or whatever. And then you also, when you do like the three sets of 20 group. So the, at the end of six weeks, the guys doing five sets of three on the compound lifts, they're beat to smithereens mm -hmm. and their, their joints are hurting. Mm -hmm. And they're also that workout takes you a lot longer than the yeah. three sets of eight workout. Um, and so, yeah, they're beat to smithereens and they're, they're overreaching. You got to back off. The moderate load group feels great. Mm -hmm. Then the high rep group. Now, theoretically, you uh, you you get accustomed to this, but they want to puke. They get nauseous because we we all think, oh, three sets of twenty—that's wimpy. No, three sets of twenty to failure is the worst thing in the world. Yeah, it especially creates, if you're strong. Yeah, if you're yeah, strong, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, like you're I doing one arm rows for twenty reps of the one thirty or something. Oh my god, it's draining. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah. It kills you, and you, you and you puke, and yeah. you get nauseous. So that's why I like about the the you know, like the eight to 12 rep range or the mm -hmm. six to six to 12 or whatever. That's the sweet spot yeah. because it's time efficient and it's not so heavy where it beats up your joints and it's not so high rep that it, that it fatigues you. But I've looked at the research on like central versus peripheral fatigue versus heavier and lighter or different exercises. And it's crazy because the re the research isn't there it doesn't i've not learned anything from the research but anecdotally you know this as a lifter some things like deadlifts beat you up more than yep. these other lifts but here's what i'll say about what i like about throwing in high rep training people really don't go to failure and here's what i always say uh, and i use some stupid analogy i'll say okay jason you're doing a three rep max deadlift and you really pull a three rep max and all of a sudden i'm there with a shock and i'm like Shh. Jason, I, I'm going to kill you and everyone you know if you don't pull another little rep. You, you, and you don't get to rest. You can't do it. You no. fit, you're like, just kill me. They didn't, they, <laughs> yeah. they didn't do anything. They don't deserve this. Just take right. me out. Whereas if, if you've done a, a set of lateral band walks and you're burning <laughs> so bad and you're like, oh, Oh, sweet Lord of Jesus, I'm burning so bad. I got to yeah. stop. I've reached failure. And I'm like, well, the shotgun comes out. Yeah, you get another 100 yards. Right. Yeah, yeah. I pull out the shotgun. And you're like, oh, okay, Ted, you can bust out yeah. 20 more. It's the same as running. You know, when you're running, you're like, I'm done. I got to stop. And all of a sudden you turn around and there's a tiger chasing you. Yeah. You would bust out in a full sprint. So the high reps aren't really going to failure. Exactly. So that's yeah. why like, they're like, it's more the pain. It's more the breathing. It's, the pain, the whole it's thing. And that's yeah. that central governor theory in running. Yeah. It's the same thing with high reps with lifting. So totally agree with you on that. They have different, they, and that's why I like variety. Also, the other thing that no one ever talks about is variety. You and I have been lifting for how many years have you been lifting years. now? 30, 30 years. years. Yeah. I've been lifting 26. You got to learn how to change it up because we got to look at the gym memberships. They're, like everyone has a gym membership, but not everyone is going. Yeah. They go and they quit. They don't know how to make their training fun. So the the best plan for you is and the, one and, and the good point is is maybe not do what we always do too. But like my buddy you met the other day, Matt, he's an actor on TV and yeah. everything. He and I just started training together occasionally. And I'm doing stuff like with too much variety. I'm like, that's not really good for you. You should stick with this. I yep. just do it because I'm bored after 30 yeah. years. You know what I mean? Exactly. But yeah. you got to. So maybe this, I always joke about like, you know, maybe the best plan for this, you know, 60 year old dude who just started training is to actually do squats, bench and deadlifts and stuff three yeah. times a week. But uh, uh, come on, you give him goblet squats, give him single, give him variety. He's going to yeah. like that more. But you know, uh, every month I'm like, I come up with some new cockamamie idea that I'm going to start doing drop sets this month. And this is going to be the secret that takes me to the next level. <laughs> Nothing ever is a secret that takes right, me. In, right, right. in my mind, it is. And that's ke what keeps me excited. Yeah. Is it train. funny that after 26 and 30 years of training, we still think that? I still <laughs> think that all the time. <laughs> and then two weeks later, I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> what was I thinking? But, yeah. but I won't give up. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what keeps me in the gym and keeps me training. And we have an adherence problem in the world. Everyone gets a gym membership. They all quit. Maybe if they knew how to make their training fun. And so it would, it wouldn't be the exact program that we would design for them. It was what would be optimal. Right. That's why I always ask people. Yeah, so you get that stuff yeah. at a level that so many people don't. Right. Brett Contreras, my man, I don't want you to miss your flight. This has got to be part one of at least three. Next yeah, time you're yeah. back in LA, we got to do it again. Absolutely. Uh, where can everyone find yourself and follow you online? 
Uh, just, you know, brettcontrez.com is my website. If you forget my name, you can always just type in the glute guy and then that my website comes up and that's where you can find links to my social media. Awesome. And then you can find out about the workshops. You'll be cranking out more training workshops, which are awesome. <laughs> and, uh, that's it guys. Thank you so much for listening. Brett, thank you so thank much. You. It was awesome. Thank you for having you, me. You got it. Promise me you're coming back for yes, part two. Absolutely. absolutely. We could talk all day. All right. Thanks. Thanks.